imagine in your head we have the opening music for Broker Talk. Welcome back. So happy to uh, have you here. We have a very, very special show today. Dr. Jim O'Connell, known as Dr. Jim on the Street, he is the president of Boston Healthcare for the Homeless. And we here in real estate understand the difficulties with homelessness. But we understand it from the bricks and mortar point of view. You either have a home or you don't have, you can buy and sell it. But homelessness is a, an aspect of our society that can be fixed. It can be worked on, but it's a very, very complicated process. Today, we have Dr. Jim O'Connell, and he has been working on this for uh, 40 years now, Dr. Jim. Um, Come on. And um, if you could, this isn't a nutshell kind of description, but you came into this after you were assigned a year long uh, from your residency at Mass General. But then how did it become your life? You know, I did. I was conscripted really literally to, to do this. My chief of medicine was very involved with the city of Boston and trying to get a grant to take care of homeless people. And back in the early to mid eighties, this modern wave of homelessness was just beginning to burgeon. And so I um, agreed as you always do with your chief of medicine, when they ask you something to do it for one year, thinking it would be my year to give back. You know, I had been a college student during the sixties and graduated in 1970. And so I had this kind of, you know, awkward social conscience that I better do something and give something back. So this was my year. And um, I, uh, so became an accidental tourist. I went down to the, my job was to go to the shelters and start to try to deliver care there, but also integrate that care with what we did in the hospitals. We had to set up a respite program, you know, to take care of homeless people who were coming out of the hospital, but had no place to go. So I was brand new and knew nothing about homelessness. And uh, it happened to be right at the beginning of this kind of uh, awful um, AIDS epidemic, combined with a TB outbreak. And I was... I thought I'd go to the shelter. It was going to be an easy clinic, you know, not like the ICU where I'd been working at MGH. Um, and I found it hopelessly complicated. And it wasn't just that I, you know, I could often make a diagnosis, but to try to then treat someone in the context of a 800 bed shelter, or somebody who was wandering around all the time was a real challenge. And um, uh, I think I got caught by initially by the complexity of, and I, you know, I'm 37. I finally am a doctor and I was, you know, doctoring is what I wanted to do. And this was really challenging doctoring. But what I wasn't ready for was the slow process of getting to know these people who I only knew superficially. And first impressions I realized were always wrong. And as I got to know their stories, they became unbelievably compelling. And after a year, it was just too soon to leave. So I asked for another year. And then the rest is I just got, I get captured. <laughs> It, it, it's it's such a compelling story, helping uh, someone out of the misery that their lives are. And it can be caused by so many different aspects of bad family, uh, grew up in a bad neighborhood, no education, um, uh, drug addiction, uh, mental uh, mental illness. Um, now, in, in your book, in the book uh, written about you and in many of the interviews, uh, you have talked about some people don't want to go to shelters. Could you explain that a little bit? Because it, it seems like, oh, it's a solution. It's really freezing out. Go into the shelter. But explain that thought process to a homeless person. Absolutely. So um, I, I live in Boston. Uh, we have had a long, the city has had a long tradition of really good sheltering. It goes back to the early 1900s. And um, there are really fabulous shelters that, you know, Pine Street in, it was a Long Island shelter, which has now moved, moved off the island. But um, Rosie's Place, they're just really really, really wonderful places. And they are, to me, life preserving. We did, we do clinics and essentially all of the adult and family shelters. But then there is, and the mayors of Boston, beginning with Mayor Flynn, um, Mayor Menino, Mayor Walsh, Mayor Janey, and now Mayor Wu have all, during my career, promised that there would be a shelter bed for anyone who wants it or a cot. So I uh, think, and so in Boston, if you want to come in and you're an adult, you can come into the shelter. Now, it turns out that group that fascinated me 
is a group that call themselves rough sleepers, uh, which is an old British term, meaning they like to sleep out in the rough. They don't want to come into the Exactly. Thank you. And um, what, uh, you know, I, I had a, had to learn, these were the people that were dying during the winter time. We realized those who were dying were not the ones who were in the shelter, but the ones who were living outside. And we started trying to figure out how do you bring healthcare to them? It was hard enough to bring healthcare to the shelters, but then getting outside. But in getting out, I worked the state department of public health funded pine street and to have a van go out every night from nine at night till five in the morning it's extraordinary it's a group of people paid people most of whom had have experience of being homeless themselves or in recovery and they go out from nine at night till five every morning and they know just about everybody who's outside and i've been able to ride on that van for the last 38 to 39 years and it serves soup and sandwiches and blankets but i can also say well i'm serving soup that if you need anything medical i can i'm a doctor i can help out uh, and it's been, it's become sort of my spiritual home. So in getting to know the people outside, I, you know, I was, it'd be five degrees outside. I'm saying, come on, why don't you come in? And for many of them, they will then tell you, they don't choose to be outside. They're very careful about telling you they are not choosing to live outside. What they are choosing to do is not go into a shelter. And if you offer them a home, they go into that home in a second. But the reasons are, are, very varied and often very complicated. But the simpler ones is, um, you know, for many, going into a 500 bed shelter is just too intimidating. Um, for many, they think the CIA or the FBI will be there and they can't go in because of their paranoia. Um, and then I, I, I told a story, I think it's in uh, Tracy's book of, it was one man one night who really taught me what was going on. It was under a bridge, it's minus five degrees, it's, uh, it's northeast are coming, I'm trying to get him to come in, it's two in the morning. And he looks at me and he's really kind, he's saying, Doc, and I had gotten to know him pretty well. He said, Doc, look, if I go into the shelter, I can't tell which voices are mine. When I stay out here, I know the voices I'm hearing are mine and I can cope with them. And so then I stopped asking people after that, why do they stay outside? Because they have very complicated reasons. We also just to let you know, men and women, for example, can't stay together in the shelves of the bar. They have to sort of split up. And so if, you, if you're if you a couple in a relationship like that, you may not want to separate for that time. So they stay outside. Yeah, and there's a level of, of trust. And, and we kind of glossed over it. Uh, uh, feeding people always brings people closer. So when you're offering sandwiches and soup to someone who is homeless, they're most likely hungry. They may not have eaten something healthy in, in a bit of time. And that opens up the doors. Um, I, I want the, uh, the real estate agents and all the professionals that are here watching this to understand some things that they can do. And so if a homeless person uh, approaches you, say they're uh, asking for money. Uh, I always called that panhandling, but you had a different term for that, tilling? Oh, we, we panhandling in, on the local is stemming. They call it stemming. Skinny. And we have no idea where it comes from. I think it's, you know, holding a cup upside down. I don't know what, but it's stemming. <laughs> well, here's the thing that I didn't know and that I do now know is what most of these people want. They, of course, want money. That's what they're asking for, because that money then, then can become food or 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 drugs or alcohol. It could become anything if you if you give of it freely and, and help that person. But really what they're looking for is acknowledgement, human acknowledgement. And uh, that must be the one of the most difficult things of being homeless is how they feel personally, let alone physically. If you're out in the weather every single day and you, you don't have a shower, you don't have a bed, you uh, uh, don't have a toothbrush, uh, how do you stay healthy? Yeah, no, you're, this is a very, uh, it's been a touchy point for us because, uh, you know, when we are out in the streets, people ask us all the time for money, et cetera, et cetera. And um, we've learned from over the years, that it's exactly what you're saying, that while people are desperately poor, and I should add, you know, it's hard, I, for me, it was hard to appreciate how poor this group of Americans are, that they, you know, many of them don't have a check at all. So they live on whatever you might give them, or they live from the you know, meals that they can get. But others will get, say, a social security check or an SSI check, you know, and that means they might have $20 at most a day to live on. Um, and that goes, you know, go to Dunkin' Donuts now and a, a, a coffee and a donut is going to take $9 of that. So 
they are desperately poor. So when they're asking for money, they have these are poor people looking for money. The question always comes up, what are they going to do with that money? And I, I think we had to sort of take the uh, the approach that that's, you know, I don't, you know, if I'm asking somebody for something, I don't have to justify what I'm going to do with it. So we try to just say, if I'm gonna, you want to give money or give cards or something, it's theirs to do with. And I think that's right. But mostly, you're exactly right. Mostly what, and these are what the nurses taught me way early on, is people are just looking to be noticed, to be acknowledged, to be seen as other human beings. And so to simply say, no, I'm sorry, I don't have any money today. I can't give you any, but how you're doing or just acknowledge them is what people are looking for. And, um, you know, that's kind of our approach now. We just don't want to ignore anybody. And I'm, you know, I'm like everybody else. When before I started doing this job, I would kind of walk by and look the other way to try to not engage someone. But in fact, you know, I should have been just acknowledging. And I do now all the time when somebody comes up to the car, I say, sorry, not today, but how are you doing? How the how you doing is so important. Um, mm -hmm. So you're suggesting that, um, sure, I'll give you some money. Uh, what do you need it for is not a question I should ask. Yeah, I don't uh, recommend that at all. I, I think it gets into a phony, phony world. And I think it, it's interesting. I, you know, uh, it, it, this is controversy within our own program about should we or should we not. We tend to never give money or not, you know, as a rule, don't give money. We give gift cards. Um, by the way, a Dunkin' Donuts card, you know, a 5 or $10 Dunkin' Donuts card gives somebody, um, you know, a, a chance to go into Dunkin' Donuts, get a cup of coffee, something, sit in the warm for a little while and use a bathroom. It's like a, it's a ticket to many things. So we often think of those as preferable to anything that at least gets out of the way of giving cash. Um, but we don't, we don't, if I do give cash and people that I've known a long time, if they're really looking terrible, I might give them $5 or something. And I don't ever ask them what I'm going to do with that. I leave that up to them. I, I love the idea of, um, uh, a Dunkin' Donuts card and a $10, uh, uh, stopping by agents, uh, lenders, uh, stop by, get a hundred dollars, get 10 cards. And the next time hand them a card let them go to the bathroom let them have a coffee let them have a donut and think about you or not think about you because it doesn't matter um this is a tragedy this is a national tragedy homelessness uh and i know that you are focused completely dr jim on the health care of the homeless and if you think about it uh, the actual uh, act of being homeless, you might not know, say you're a, a stage one diabetic and your your uh, food intake is horrible and you're getting Dunkin' Donut cards, you know, you could become stage two or stage three. And, and really all you know is that it's harder to walk or something like that. Um, is there any uh, is there any education aspect that comes with the uh, healthcare homelessness? Is there uh, anything that can be done on um, an individual level uh, that can help? Um, oh, yes. I mean, we've learned, you know, and uh, by the way, this was a, you know, learning by going out there and doing it. There was no fixed way to do it. But we learned that homeless people, when you live, um, and I'm, I should be very careful, I should say, we are care is mostly for those people who've been chronically homeless, living in the shelters, the ones you will see outside. There's a, for all of the agents here, there are many people who are homeless temporarily because of fire or loss of a job or something. And all they need is to get into another apartment and they're going to be, they're going to be fine or their lives will be fine. Right. But for the people you see chronically out in the streets, um, and, and I, I often cite this just to let you know how complicated it is. So about 25% of the men we see on the street cannot read or write. So when you think about why are they homeless or what's going on, you have to, you have to, and as we've learned, their lives are very complicated. Where they came from, the trauma they suffered as kids, often physical or sexual or emotional, um, poor schools, as you cited out, living in blighted areas, and then having little things like ADD, um, but wasn't recognized in a school where everything was chaotic. And so you're, trouble, you're labeled a troublemaker and they never learn your skills. And then at age, you know, you, you can't you you can't work, and so you're outside on the streets trying to survive. So I, I have a huge, um, you know, a, a huge acknowledgement that I didn't understand the complexity of homelessness. And the further I've gone along, the more I realize it's a very complicated societal problem. 
it of course will not be solved until we can build and have enough housing for people. But you know, as we all know, it's the housing is the is the you know the foundation for the solution. But we still need to make, provide a lot of support. So we need to all be in this together. Um, and um, I, what we have learned when you, we've had to step back and realize to house all the people that are currently homeless is going to take a big societal effort. It's going to take some time. And so we've had to remember our focus is on how do you take care of the people who are currently homeless? Our job isn't to solve the big problem, even though I desperately want it solved. I'm a doctor and I can't solve that, but I can take care of the people in front of us. So for example, the chronic diseases that people have Diabetes, like you mentioned, think of it. Diabetes requires a good diet, exercise, taking your insulin, which needs to be refrigerated. None of that is possible if you're living on the streets. Um, so we have to learn how to manage diabetes without the usual treatment plan. So we have to get very creative. Um, and education is a huge part of that, about how to maintain that. But I think if you've got $5 today to eat some food, you're gonna to go to McDonald's where you can get in full and not to the Whole Foods where you can get a really, you know, a good apple. You're just not going to do it. It's not going to, you know, so we have to figure out how to, you know, make food insecurity, you know, a little, a little bit, uh, improve it somehow. But I would also say there are very, we've learned there, are, you know, HIV, for example, which when I started was, you know, I lived in the early days of the epidemic when everybody died, essentially. And now we have these remarkable medications that is transform this absolutely deadly disease into a chronic disease that we can manage. So our goal is to, for people living outside, living on the streets, make sure we get to them and get them their medication and make it as easy for them to take it. And so we have a remarkable team that just follows five or 600 people who are living on the streets and the shelters of HIV, and they're all doing remarkably, 95% of them are doing really well. And that isn't solving their homelessness, but it is teaching us that we can do better at taking care of them. So that's just an, an example of kind of things we try to do, acknowledging that we may not find a home for everybody yet. Well, that, the, the home, the whole, where do you build these homes is uh, an issue that we're going to get into right now. But um, like the Pine Street Inn, I think there's 400 uh, beds there. Uh, a lot of people don't want to go in and, and sleep in a big dorm because they have all kinds of issues related to big groups of people or being around people they don't know. So I know that Connecticut was using Motel 8s and putting people into smaller places. Houston has a good program uh, where, where they're building. But it's a, what is it called, a NIMBY problem, not in my neighborhood. Um, but uh, I know in so many neighborhoods, they're putting hospice care. And, and that is a, a, a place where people are going to be for a, a short period of time, and then they're going to be gone. If you can have that, why then can't you have a homeless shelter, you know, where uh, give people a place to get healthy um, in this? But it's zoning. Zoning and, and um, towns accepting uh, the building of these kinds of uh, properties are what's slowing it down. Um, you have in some of the counties here, some of the towns, you have a two-acre uh, minimum, Sudbury. And, and that's not just uh, there, but in many towns, there uh, you can't build a tiny home. Say you have a, a parent who um, doesn't have any money anymore, and they're, they don't want to be by themselves, why can't they move to a tiny house on your lot? And I think this is where the real estate industry can be a huge help by going to these committee meetings and, in fact, advocating for this kind of thing in their towns. Is that something that there are resources on a state level? Uh, because it's such a local level issue. Oh, and I uh, I so appreciate what you're saying on this, Larry, because um, what I've learned, I thought medicine was complicated, but I think you live in a much more complicated housing and real estate world, um, because with all of the, you know, there, there's, there are federal, state, um, county, town restrictions that all, all interact, and it makes the building of, of very low-income housing very, very difficult, and we obviously need 
you know, we need a huge amount. And I think of, I was, I was just talking to my friends in LA and there's about 60,000 homeless people in LA right now. Most of them are on the streets and living in tents under the thing. And just the thought of finding 60,000 you know, units just to house the currently homeless people. And remember, more people are becoming homeless all the time. So it's that plus others. And LA has done something, like you said, they realize their, their zoning restrictions make it almost impossible. So one thing they have done in California, which I'm sure you, I think it's California rather than LA, is allow you now to build a, to use your garage or something on your, on your property to build a smaller place, like an in-law apartment that you can then rent out. So that's going to open up a, up a lot of possibilities but houston taught me a lot of a lot and um houston uh has done as much as i think any big city at solving you know at least ending homelessness for many people but in houston i was stunned they have very few zoning laws so if i own a piece of property in houston and i decide i want to build a shelter i can build it tomorrow i don't have a community process to go through there's no i can the zoning restrictions are pretty easy um, but if you tried to do that same thing in Seattle or San Francisco or Boston, it would take you three, four years, and you probably would be told no by the community process. Yeah, so right. we, we have a lot to learn from each other, but what can be done? And this is the other lesson for me is that this is a local problem, like all politics is local. Homelessness and the sol the solving of homeless homelessness becomes a very local problem. Um, and then the further thing that I think is haunting most of us, I love what Boston has done a ton of the, the the, the mayors, including the current mayor, have been really working on getting housing, uh, low income housing up and with all the requirements and stuff. Uh, but it one of the one of the things that haunts us is usually you can only find one spot and you have to put a lot of people in that one thing. When in fact, I think what we're trying to do is figure out how do you have all of us in our society share in in helping solve this problem rather than put it all in one spot. And that's when big cities like Boston is going to feel particularly you know, picked on because why build so many services there when we've got all the other neighborhoods around that could right. could take the run. So that's it's going to be, I think, um, uh, it. we definitely have to look at it. The nimbyism is huge right. um, and fueled by a very complicated process where we have, I know of one spot that we were trying to build something and one neighbor who's upset can legitimately legally delay the process six months and then another six months and another six without you know any reason other than they have that right. right uh so i know we have a lot a long way to go i think it's a very solvable problem though if we could just get ourselves together and look at it as a as a community problem and not a not a housing problem and not just a uh, health problem just it's a, all of our problems well, it, it is all of our problems, and, and some people understand that, uh, and some people say, it's not my problem. I don't have that problem. I've got a house, you know, and, and it's a whole different level of philosophy and thinking um, about um, am I here to help? Am I here to serve? Am I here to just make money and, and enjoy the spoils of the money that I've made? Um, it's a different way of thinking. Um, do you find with the people that you work with on a daily basis that these people are compassionate and and caring as a driving force or are they doing a job because they were once homeless and they understand it and they they want to help uh i think it's a mix but i i would when i first started doing this i was trained I was trained by Barbara McGinnis, who was the nurse at Pine Street Inn, who had been doing this for a long time. And I showed up as a doctor and she put me under her wing because she realized doctors didn't know how to handle this. And she was right. But um, I remember one of the things that she emphasized to me and why I think I said this in the beginning was I don't want they don't she doesn't want saints and zealots around. They're too difficult to work with. This is she said, this is a tough job and we need good people who are really interested in, in in a job like this. And she was right. The medicine was compelling for me. You know, it was like complicated. I was trying to figure it out. But in, in that those early days, I it was a job to be done. And, and that's kind of what, what drew us to do that. I think once you do the job and get to know the people you're caring for, then you become much it becomes a much more a much different approach. Then then you know it's all about the continuity and once you've gotten to know someone and they've allowed you into their lives which often takes months if not years of just being there then um you know 
then you are, you know, and this is just being a doctor, you know, when you're a doctor, you like to stick with your patients, you know, because you know them well, and you want to follow through. And so that privilege of being part of their lives, even though their lives are otherwise chaotic, you become a really stabilizing presence. Um, and from a, you know, from a personal side, that's kind of what you're looking for when you're a healthcare worker. You you want to be somewhere where you're needed, able to offer your skills to someone who appreciates them. And I can tell you, there's no one who appreciates care more than people living on the streets and in the shelters. They are they're just delightful. And as you get to know their lives and they invite you in, it becomes even more compelling. Well, I think one of the things that you learned early on, and um, it's a mantra of, of mine as well, and I think you learned it being a bartender, that you have to listen, you know, and uh, bartender, by the way, bartenders don't always listen. <laughs> they, they don't. But uh, I, I have said that all my life when people ask me what I do. I say I listen for a living. Because if I don't know what you want, I can't help you. Um, and uh, being able to listen to what someone – and people aren't always right down the path. Um, they, they will take some time to get the story told, and you have to give them that time. And medicine doesn't always do that. You're on a treadmill. You've got 15 minutes, and then you're on to the next one and the next one. But that is not the way that your life is, especially when you're in the van the, uh, the nights that you're out. Hmm. Oh, you are, your words are you know, striking to my soul here, Larry, because it is um, you know, the, the complexity of the lives of people who end up on the streets and in our shelters for a long time is, is actually you know, awesome. They have lived through all sorts of things and they will often, they'll trust you a little bit, but then a year later, they might trust you a little more. And I can't tell you how many people after 10 or 15 years when I'm caring for them and they're dying of cancer, when I learn even more, um, and had no idea. Um, and had I known all that, I would have been, just, you know, you, it just lets you know why people are there and that it's, uh, I have yet to meet maybe once I met someone who really, I think chose to be homeless and almost, if you get to know them, you start to realize that the structural flaws in so many areas of our society, whether it's corrections or poverty or racism or schools, what you name it, um, the welfare system, the foster care system, you realize that those structural inequities really end up pushing someone into homelessness down the line. So I see homelessness now as not, you know, it's a, it's the end result of many, many insults from very various parts of our society. And I have come to appreciate that as I've been able to learn more and more about the stories of the people we care for. So many people start their day thinking, okay, today is Monday and I'm going to do this this week and, and all of that. Um, that's not the way homeless people live. They live from moment to moment. So uh, they don't have any money. They, because of that, they won't have any food. They won't have any place to stay. So their day-to-day -day lives are very, very different than the way people with a home and, and some um, financial stability will think about their days. How does that impact their health uh, when you live? Mo it's crisis management to me is moment-to-moment -moment living. It's like, I don't know what's going to happen, but... I'll have to be ready, whatever it is. Right. I think we learned um, the hard way that the immediacy of trying to survive on the streets or in the shelters, uh, you know, negates all of our usual healthcare, you know, structures. So we can't, for example, make appointments for people. If you say, come see me next Tuesday, that is a meaningless, useless thing. So we have to have our clinics open and say, please come whenever you can. And when somebody comes, we cherish that and see them. Um, so that was one thing that we learned early on about the immediacy of life on the streets. But then there's, um, you know, there's many, many other things that come up. Like I remember um, during COVID, you know, and we have, this was a lesson we had learned, but it became vividly clear during COVID there are five or 600 people in a shelter. If the virus gets into that shelter, it's devastating. You know, 30 to 40% of everybody living in the shelters during that first wave got COVID. Um, and when people were exposed, you couldn't leave them in the shelter. You had to try to find some place to let them isolate or quarantine. And 
So that was a challenge, you know, finding hotels or whatever it was. And it turned out we we ended up with a place in the Boston Convention Center that we had 500 beds that the governor and the mayor gave to us right side, right next to where Mass General had a 500 bed thing. But when you isolate people who have no money, they can't just stay there. You know, you have to feed them. You have to. And then you understand there's a whole bottom part of their life that they need to be outside negotiating. That's how they live. And if you take them out of that. So, you know, the simple thing of go home and isolate didn't work for homeless people because you had to go home and make sure they have their meals, make sure there's, you know, things there. And it was very, you know, it became glaringly clear how, what living in poverty can really do to your health. Right. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I, I keep thinking about that all the time, you know, that's it's. it's it's really tough if you have no money to buy the right food, to live in a place, you know, then there's a cascade of things that happen. The net result is, you know, we have, for example, the leading cause of death for our folks, especially those living on the streets, um, you would think would be hypothermia or, or, you know, exposure to cold or assault, but overwhelmingly it's cancer. You know, it's the end result, you know, cancer from having started smoking early or maybe drinking a little too much. And then you see at age 30 and 40 and 50, people are getting these cancers that you don't usually see until people are much, much older. So the homelessness really accelerates um, the devastation of chronic illnesses and really, I think, in many ways can cause other illnesses. So that we've had to we've had to cope with and learn. Um Here's a question I always like to, as we, we, I'm sorry, we don't have more time, but um, what haven't I asked you that you think would be a good, a good question for me to have asked you that you'd like to share with, with the audience? Um, you know, I, I was thinking this is such a rare opportunity for me, Larry, to actually talk to people who are, or do the housing part of this, as opposed to me who does the healthcare stuff. And um I think that the the delicate dance between housing and health is an important one to concentrate on. And I, we have watched people who've been on the streets for 20 and 25 years get into low threshold housing programs. And it's like a miracle when they get in. But then we realize that all of those things we've been describing that can contribute to chronic homelessness don't go away just because you go into a across a threshold into us. And so the support that I think we need to provide for you who are building homes, uh, which I think should come from government as well as everywhere else, is really important. Because I don't think our experience is it's okay for a little bit, maybe a year, but then the the furies that drove somebody to the streets in the first place will show themselves and you really need to provide care for them. So I would urge everybody to think about, you know, what we really need is truly supportive kinds of housing. We need the the structure of the housing really in good places and done the way you guys know how to do it. But then I think it's our obligation to figure out how do we make sure those people, when they get in there, have support so that they can be good tenants that maintain their, right. their tenancy. Right. And there's um, a the, program called Section 8 and that that has helped people. I know in in my industry, some people don't want Section 8 at all. My personal experience is Section 8, they're, they're, uh, they can't be criminals. Um, they may often have jobs. They're struggling, and the Section Eight program allows them. I find them to be fantastic tenants. You know, they hmm. they want to stay. They know that if they don't stay, that it's going to be worse for them. And yet, in every situation, there are people who take advantage, and uh, you find those people pretty quickly as well. But caring about others. Um, uh, deeply in your heart and taking actions on a day-to-day -day basis um, separates us. And would you consider that one of your legacies? I know you have a young child and you want to live as long as possible, uh, but uh, ultimately uh, we all meet uh, a similar end, uh, except Walt Disney. I think he's in a cryogen somewhere, but... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and that's a no, that's his head. I don't know. <laughs> uh, no, it's a great it's a great question, Larry. Because I, you know, at, being at this far end of my, you know, forty years down the line, I'm starting to think about God. What have we done? Has any, you know, what is has all this been worth it? What's going on? And as I hinted before, you know, I grew up in a world where, you know, we're, you know, I'm an Irish. I grew up in an Irish Catholic, you know, 
town where guilt played a very big part of our lives. And it was usually what we were not doing what we rather than what we were doing. So I think I have a tendency to look back and realize the failures we had, the things we didn't get done. But a, but what I would say, and I, I do, for those who are on the, you know, I, we didn't have, I didn't have a child till it was very late in life. And it's been like a gift given to us. But I also realized I won't be around for that much of her life. So part of when I think legacy, I think of what do I want her to know about her dad? What did I do? I want to, and it focuses it a little bit for me. So I think there's no question for me is I, you know, I, I, I lucked out. I became an, a really accidental tourist in a world that I grew to love among a bunch of people who I slowly got to know over time and have had the advantage of knowing them for decades. And that, is what I think most of us as doctors and nurses want. We want to be able to take care of people who need us and um, you know, ease their suffering. At the same time, I've had to step back and say, and this is what I said, that I don't think I've done much to solve the problem of homelessness from a societal perspective. I think that's going to be something that all of us have to do, the housing and the health and the right. justice and the uh, other communities together. But I would say that our job has really been to... Um, to get to know the people on the street, take care of them best we can, stand with them through light and dark, and then um, ease any suffering that we can. And I think that's the legacy that I would want to hold on to. And and it's clear that you do have that legacy. And um, I am just so pleased to have met you and had this opportunity for you to come. And in particular, one particular thing, I love seeing somebody's office who has more piles than I do. (laughs) <laughs> well, thank you so much. And I that talk, I, I do this because it reminds me what chaos I live in. So thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Someday I'll finish reading that one way up there. <laughs> okay. But thank, thank you so much. It's been an honor. So I really much. appreciate it. Dr. Jim O'Connell, uh, the Boston Healthcare for the Homeless. And uh, thank you again for all that you do. It's been an incredible pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you for uh, being a loyal listener. And we'll see you next week when we have another great show. Thanks, Dr. Jim. Thank you so oh, much. Um, no, you're so welcome. That was fun. Thank you for doing that. I appreciate your questions. You're good. <laughs> well, that, uh, that is a big thing to me because after seeing so many people, that you've talked to, I think, what can I ask him that he hasn't been asked? Oh, you have a, you have a gift, Larry. I appreciate it. Thank you.